Okay. Hi for those of you that are watching out there. This is Steve Dale uh, here, and uh, this is part of our series of MCLE programs uh, here on um, a series we're calling the Essentials of Disability Advocacy. Uh, now for those of you that are watching for credit, if you're an attorney or a trustee, throughout the presentation, what you're going to see uh, here is our, our, our speaker is going to announce three codes. You need to write down those three codes uh, here, and you will be getting a form to fill those codes in to get MCLE credit. That would be if you're looking for credit for the state bar, if you're an attorney or a trustee. So let's get on to the program uh, today. I'm really excited about this uh, program, and I've heard this many times before. Uh, this is really an essential uh, information, especially uh, I would say not just for folks with autism here, although that's going to be our focus, but it really is dealing with mental health um, uh, issues and insurance. Uh, Karen Fessel founded the uh, Mental Health uh, and Autism Insurance Project after struggling to secure autism treatments for her son. She has, um, she has a doctorate in public health from UC Berkeley and has been helping families nationally secure mental health and autism treatments. Uh, for their loved ones over the last 10 years. So anyway, without any further ado, uh, here I want to welcome uh, Karen here for sharing her, uh, her information and her knowledge uh, here with all of us. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, this talk is about navigating the maze of health insurance for autism and mental health related interventions. We have a lot to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about I'm from the Mental Health and Autism Insurance Project. Our website is mhautism.org. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do, possible payers for those with special needs, why health insurance, laws which confer protections on those um, that need health insurance, different types of health insurance and why it matters, we're going to talk about Medi-Cal and a law that, pro, that, pro, that offers some protections for children called EPSDT. We're going to talk about Medica Medicaid waivers and how you can use them with co-pays. What is medically necessary? What is medical necessity? What can be covered? What typically is not covered? We'll talk about requesting treatments. Network insufficiency. That's when the network, when there aren't um, providers that can see your child with the expertise that you need, what to do if you've been denied treatment, what goes into an appeal, external reviews, and takeaway messages. So we are a um, nonprofit organization. We, founded, we were founded about 10 years ago when parents came together and we realized we all had kids on the autism spectrum and we realized that the healthcare system really wasn't providing anything for our children. Some of us were able to get some services through regional centers, others were able to get some services through the school districts, but we weren't getting anything through our healthcare systems. So our mission is to help families, professionals, and people with autistic spectrum disorders and mental health conditions get necessary health care services through insurance so that they can ultimately be the best person that they can be. And about three or four years ago, I got a phone call from a parent who had a child on the spectrum who was seeking residential mental health treatment. And um, she asked me, can you help me? Have you ever done this? And I said, I don't know, but I can try. And we, I appealed for her and we won. And since then, we've been working with um, families that are trying to get mental health coverage, including residential, partial hospital, intensive outpatient, and wilderness therapy covered through their insurance as well. Um, so we field a lot of questions from the, the public um, through email and through phone. Um, my email is karen at mhautism.org and we will answer your questions and we offer a free consult um, to families and providers um, or facilities on how to work with specific denials and we help them strategize. 
Um, we also will uh, file claims and follow up on claims payment. We write appeals. We do a lot of appeal writing um, and uh, requests for internal, uh, I'm sorry, independent medical review. We do, um, if your facility or provider doesn't do it, we will do uh, pre and ongoing authorizations for mental health treatments. We work with the state regulators in many states um, at the point that you're, uh, you've exhausted, usually after you've exhausted your appeals in network, I mean in the plan. Um, we offer advice on how to get single case agreements. Single case agreements are when the network doesn't have what you need. Um, so we offer families um, advice on how to get them. We do all this on a sliding scale based on household income. We also, um, the law in this area is constantly changing. Um, we went through a lot of changes recently with healthcare reform, and there were changes, um, there were regulations that came out to the Federal Mental Health Parity Act. And then we also offer, um, uh, um, there's a lot of class actions right now. And so we try to keep our um, families updated on changes in the law, and we do this through our quarterly newsletter and through our website. And if you go to our website, um, mhautism.org, and you scroll down, you can sign up to, for our newsletter. Um, we also work with legislators and regulators, um, and we try to educate them on the needs of our families. We were involved in getting SB 946, the autism mandate passed in California, and um, we often go up to Sacramento and we'll sit down and we'll, we'll talk to um, both regulators and, educator on, and legislators on what um, services our families need and what's not working. We also offer um, educational sessions and workshops to the community like this one. So we're in a unique position to identify a lot of the gaps in the system and when things don't work, we first try telling the insurance company, sometimes they don't really um, they're not really about making things work efficiently. And so if, um, if they're not interested, we will tell the regulator when something doesn't work right. Um, and we will inform them of systemic problems. And we also will go to policymakers and legislators and um, to try to develop fixes. Um, we don't take no for an answer, and we try to find a way to make it work. Um, the picture here is myself. My son is on the right. Um, Dave Jones, our insurance commissioner, is on my left, and then Theda Al-Malidi. She's um, autism parent and advocate extraordinaire. She's on our board. And Dave has been really um, uh, good with working with our families, especially with autism, and he put out a number of regulations that have been very helpful to our families. Um, below is a picture of Theda with Governor Brown. He said, if I let you take that picture, I'm going to have to let everybody take that picture, a picture with me. And she went click, and she doesn't take no for an answer, and neither do we. So I thought I'd share that with you. That's my son, Aaron. I started down this path 10 years ago. Um, it took us three years to get him a diagnosis. And, um, and in that time, we kind of rolled around within the system. We got speech and occupational therapy for him, and we got... Um, uh, social skills therapy for him. He's made a lot of progress. He's doing really well. Um, but uh, those er during those early years, it was very hard to get services covered through um, insurance. And um, I had to, I appealed with my plan. I lost. I went to the regulator. Initially, I lost. And then I, I kind of gave them an earful. I think they're just used to siding with the um, health insurance industry, or they were. I gave them an earful. And, um, and then they, um, they actually reversed their position, and I won my, uh, my request for regulatory intervention and it ordered the plan to pay. And, um, and ever since that happened, I have a doctorate in public health, and um, I'm a good writer. And so I was like, gosh, that was so hard. What would it be like if I didn't know how to write? What would it be like if I didn't have English as my first language? What would it be like if I didn't have a background in public health? And so um, that gave me the impetus to start my own organization and, um, and to help people work with insurance. Um, school districts. So there are several payers for our kids with special needs. There is the school district. Um, and um, they are mandated by a federal law called the Individuals with 
Disabilities Education Act. And um, this has been around since the mid-70s, and it's a really strong law, um, but it often doesn't get enforced, and often our kids don't get quite what they need. Um, regional centers, um, they are mandated to provide services in California for um, people from cradle to grave with developmental conditions. And this includes life skills, adaptive living, deinstitutionalization, and this is protected, their rights are protected by a law called the California Lanterman Act. Well, the health system um, is a different system, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, what the laws are that offer protections for people with um, autism and other special conditions, including mental health. Um, and we're going to talk about it in both the private and public sector. So why all this interest in health insurance? Well, it's a benefit that we pay for. We may pay for it in the form of tax dollars that support um, Medicaid and even public um, uh, benefits for public employees. We um, pay for it. We may pay directly. We may write a check every month to the insurance company. Um, or we may um, pay through for it um, uh, uh, through um, our salary, through we, like deductions every month. Schools and regional centers are supposed to pay to use generic resources first. And regional center especially, they're supposed to use generic resources. And insurance is a form of a generic resource that is available. Um, autism and mental health conditions are medical conditions. Standards of medical necessity are higher than educational standards. We're going to talk about that later, but educational standards really involve um, providing an appropriate program, whereas medical necessity standards include um, alleviating your disability and addressing the, the what isn't working right in your body. Mental health is one of 10 essential health care benefits that are required to be covered through the Affordable Care Act. So specific laws that offer protections to people with um, mental health and um, autism conditions. Um, the Federal Mental Health Parity is a great law. Um, it's, no, it's FMH, it's Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. It was um, uh, enacted in 2008 um, in the final days of the Bush administration in the stimulus package. It went through in the stimulus package of 2008. And um, it basically requires that mental health be treated the same as medical surgical conditions with respect to co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles, and visit limits. So those are all the quantitative limitations. Um, however, there were two sets of regulations that came out afterwards that addressed non-quantitative treatment limitations. Um, and these regulations basically require that a broad scope of therapies, including intermediate forms of mental health treatment, be covered. And they would specifically named residential treatment, intensive outpatient, partial hospital treatment, and outpatient treatment. Um, federal law extends uh, to nearly all plans. So this is a federal law. It used to be only, it only covered um, uh, those with it, that worked for employers that had 50 or more employees. And, but with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, it extended to nearly all plans, including those that you buy on the exchange, individual plans, and small group employers. Um, so the state autism mandates. Many states have specific mandates that require people with ASDs to be able to get medically necessary treatment to maximize their functioning to the greatest extent pra practical. And um, these mandates, they're um, now in about 45 of the 50 states have these mandates. And it impacts, but it impacts only fully funded plans. So those are state regulated plans because they're state laws. So if you have a certain type of plan called a self-funded plan, it may not have an autism mandate. Um, EPSDT is a special federal law that covers um, children on Medicaid, and it stands for Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. This law has been around since, I believe, all the mid-70s, and it's a special federal law, um, and um, it requires that children 
with any kind of, with certain kind of mental health or developmental conditions and other medical conditions as well, be screened. If they don't pass the screen, then they need to be assessed with and diagnosed. And then once they get their diagnosis, their condition needs to be treated. And it applies to many conditions, including mental health and developmental conditions. So um, it's a great law, and it's really, um, it has some really good protections. However, there aren't enough lawyers to address it and make sure that it gets enforced. So if you're a lawyer out there listening, we encourage you. This is a field that needs more people than there are. Other provisions within the Affordable Care Act allow um, uh, external medical reviews, no exclusions for pre-existing conditions, no maximum limits on payments, and many other consumer protections. So there are several basic types of plans, and we're going to talk about them today. Um, one way that you can find out what's covered is get a copy of your policy manual. Um, and this is usually about a 100-page document. If you have a self-funded plan, it's usually called the um, Detailed Summary Plan Description. And you can usually get it by logging on to your employer website and um, with an employer ID, and then you can download it. Sometimes you might have to ask your HR, the HR company, for a copy of it. It's supposed to be updated at least every five years, and there are supposed to be addendums when the law changes. Um, if you are, if you have, and it usually applies to large private companies, large companies. Um, so if you work for an employer that has more than 500 employees, there's a good chance you have a self-insured plan. Um, if you um, have a fully funded plan, it means it's regulated by the state. Usually the state you live in, but it could be the state that your company is headquartered in. And most small uh, plans, um, uh, small employers, if you work for a company that has 100 or fewer employees, Chances are they have a, a state regulated or fully funded plan. It can be downloaded, um, the manual can be downloaded from the plan, from the um, insurance company website after you log in with your ID. Or it can be, sometimes you can get it from the employer. Um, parent can also ask um, HR for a copy. Medicaid and um, federal and state government plans, um, like if you work for the federal government or your state government, or if you have a Medicaid managed care organization, usually those are publicly available and you can Google them. Um, so if you're helping a family with an appeal, it's a good idea to request a copy of the plan manual, explain the rules around appealing, and um, it explains the rules around appealing and it, um, is, it can serve as a guide, it explains the rules around filing claims, what's covered, what's not covered, etc. Um, so self-insured plans, employers are the insurers. They actually pay out the claims. Insurers are the third-party administrators. They administer the plan. Um, and um, self-insured plans, common among large employers, more than 1,000 employees. Who's responsible? It really depends whether um, your employer is calling the shots or the health plan is calling the shots, and it depends on the contract that they have with each other. Um, it's typically governed by federal law, um, and there's a federal law called ERISA, the Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. It's a law that um, pertains to benefits that you get through your employer. Um, the ACA off also um, has some um, red does is responsible for some of the federal laws that govern how self-insured plans are practiced and also the Mental Health uh, Parity Addiction Equity Act um, applies to self-insured plans because it's a federal law. The Department of Labor offers minimal regulation. They will get involved if there's a problem getting a copy of the manual. They may get involved if the plan isn't responding to your claims or your um, denials. But for the most part, they don't provide as much um, regulation as we would like to see. Um, self-insured plans, more about that. Why does it matter if your plan's self-insured? Well, if there are disputes, sometimes the employer can step in and help. They can say, you know what, 
This is really important to us. It's important that you provide this benefit and we want you to pay the claim. But if either one of them, the um, insurance company or the employer, is determined not to pay it, it can be hard to get them to pay it. Um, if there's a dispute about medical necessity, um, after in appealing inside the plan, you do have the right to go to external review. However, the reason there's a kangaroo there is that these reviews are paid for by the employers and they can be difficult to overturn. We've done it, we've won some of them, but it's just not the norm. Um, lit litigation is sometimes a better option. Um, after you've exhausted your internal appeals, if you have a dispute about medical necessity, which is why we need more lawyers to work in this field. Ask your employer to help if you're being denied for something that you need. Um, the autism um, community has um, been able to locate other people that, that were covered by the same employer. They go together, they've spoken up to their employers, and many of these companies have adopted um, behavior health benefits for children with autism because the families have gone to the employers and told them that this is a benefit that they really need and um, they value their employees. So it can be done. Um, so for self-insured plans, um, federal mental health parity applies. However, they often exclude or limit treatments for autism. And we still sometimes see uh, exclusions for people with developmental disabilities. Um, to an extent, they get to decide what they're going to cover. And to an extent, they don't. And some of these companies um, have been recently sued for failing to provide behavioral health benefits for um, uh, people with autism. And um, there have been some cases, especially in Washington State, um, I believe, um, Lock was it Lockheed? No, it was Boeing um, got sued and that suit was successful and also T-Mobile um, was sued and that suit was, dis was um, successful as well. So this is another area where we need more lawyers to take these cases to court. Um, some plans have explicit exclusions for wilderness therapy. Um, if there's no exclusion, then they really shouldn't be excluding for them. Um, and we've, see, we've been seeing a lot of um, court cases as well in this area where um, the companies that are excluding wilderness therapy are getting taken to court, and there are several co open class actions right now. Um, in California, if you've been denied for behavior health therapy for, for your, your loved one with autism, we encourage you to request a denial letter from the self-insured plan that's denying and give the letter to your regional center caseworker if your loved one with autism has regional center services. And they can either provide it or get you set up um, with the Medicaid waiver and um, have your loved one access services through Medi Medi-Cal Managed Care Organization. Um, so these services can be provided through other routes in California. Um, fully funded plans. If you have a state regulated, if you have a fully funded plan in the state of California, we actually have two state regu regulators. Um, the Department of Managed Healthcare, who regulates um, all the HMOs and most of the blue plans. And then there's the California Department of Insurance that regulates PPOs in non-blue plans. Um, and um, they also, they will get involved if you have an individual plan that you purchased on or off the exchange in California. And plans obtained through small or medium employers that are state uh, regulated or fully funded. Fully funded plans, they're subject to federal law, but they're also subject to state mental health parity mandates and autism mandates. And in California, we have a very strong state mental health mandate that requires that people with one of approximately nine conditions um, get all medically necessary treatment for their condition. And uh, many state regulators will intervene when plans are violating the law. And so it's important um, to uh, contact the regulator when there's a problem after you've exhausted your, after you've talked first with your health plan. Medical disputes can re be resolved through the independent medical review process. The California overturn rates are pretty high. They're about 60%. 
but they tend to be more fair. They tend to be more fair than self-funded plans, and they tend to be a little bit um, better for those that um, have autism that are seeking behavioral health therapy than they are for those that um, have mental health conditions and are seeking uh, residential treatment. And I don't know why that is. We've been working with them, and we're trying to get it resolved, but it's a long, slow process. Medi-Cal is also regulated by the DMHC. Some of the laws um, apply, and some of them are different. They do not have the state mental health parity mandate. I believe the a whole um, behavior health treatment for autism is mandated through EPSDT and not through the California autism mandate. So um, the laws are a little different, but um, if you have a dispute and a denial, they will intervene with the appeal process. Um, in California, um, what benefits are typically covered? Um, a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation uh, for both mental health and developmental conditions for those that have are positive on a screening test. Uh, behavior that's required by the state mandate, the state mental health mandate. Behavior therapy for those with a diagnosis of autism um, in both commercial plans and Medi-Cal. And Medi-Cal has a new benefit that they're just bringing out now that basically says that if you have some type of remediable condition and you are a child and you have Medi-Cal, um, they are required to cover it. And that might include severe behaviors that aren't autism. It might include um, uh, 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 moderate um, learning issues or not le uh, cognitive um, issues. And um, it might include things like Down syndrome or traumatic brain injury. So there is some evidence um, for those conditions. Um, speech, PT, and OT, if you have um, a mental health condition and you need those treatments, um, it needs to be in the amount that is medically necessary. And some plans put limits on those treatments, but they're not supposed to do them in California for those with ASD and who need them for mental health treatment because it's a limitation in mental health parity. Um, assistive devices are supposed to be covered up to 50% in private plans. And um, what we have found, though, is that they really push back on it, paying for anything like an iPad that is de isn't dedicated. And they also push back um, that if you're trying to get an assistive device through Medi-Cal, and your child also is a regional client, regional center client, it might be a lot easier to go through regional center to get that covered. Um, mental health therapy for those with mental health conditions, including the full spectrum of care, is covered through commercial insurance, inpatient, residential, partial hospital, intensive outpatient, outpatient, and California, at least at the DMHC, won't allow um, blanket denials for wilderness, which is pretty unusual and progressive. Um, for Medi-Cal, it really varies. What you can get varies by county. It's all done through the county mental health system. And I know that a lot of this has been worked on by um, Jim Bell and the, um, the state, uh, the Senate Select Committee on Mental Health. They're trying to reform that. Um, but there's still a lot of variation in what services you can get by county. Um, however, whether it's covered or not, it must be medically necessary in order for a service to be covered. And what that means is a complicated thing that we're going to talk about in a later slide. What's generally not covered? Treatments that don't have a lot of um, evidence. Uh, that would be peer-reviewed controlled research. Um, they like meta-analyses. They like um, uh, uh, position statements by um, professional organizations that have expertise in the area. Um, therapies for learning issues which benefit the school but may not benefit other environments. So if you're trying to get occupational therapy and your child is having difficulty holding a pencil and making their letters, see if your child also has difficulty um, holding a knife and fork and cutting their meat because um, it's easier to get the OT approved if it's for something like eating, which is a very basic function, than it is for something like writing, which they might try to say is um, the job of the school and the IEP. Biomedical and alternative therapies. Um, the doctor visits for these sessions may be covered if you have a PPO, 
but treatments and labs and stuff are often are not. And we see a lot of this in the autism community. We might see enzymes, we might see, um, we used to see more of chelation um, and other types of um, treatments that, uh, um, and it may be difficult to get these therapies covered through insurance. Um, long stays in inpatient, residential, partial hospital, and IOP may be challenging. Um, and, um, and there are a variety of reasons for this. And um, we would argue that as long as they um, continue to have substantial need and they're making progress, um, they, you know, and they're continuing, you know, that there's still a real need for it, that it's worth it to fight it. Um, and this is an example of something that um, just hasn't um, come as far as we'd like to see. Um, but we're still working on it and we're still fighting those, those um, denials. Wilderness therapy in many plans is not covered, but there are many class actions that are open. And if you're trying to get it and you've been denied, um, we can try to um, connect you with some of those class actions. Um, and other things that aren't covered is anything that can arg be argued not to be medically necessary. And they can make arguments and they can, they've gotten pretty sophisticated and so have we. <laughs> so how to tell if a plan is self-funded or fully funded? Well, you can look at the back of the card um, down here highlighted. It says insured by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Insured by a health insurance company means it's fully funded. This one's fully funded in the state of New Jersey. Um, on the right, we have uh, a big company, J.P. Morgan and Chase, and it says administered by Sigma Life Insurance. You might see ASO benefits only, you, um, and that's code for self-funded. Um, so certain states have laws. It would be really nice if California um, had a law mandating that they put this information on the card because it can save you time to try to figure it out. Um, another way to tell is look in the plan manual, um, look in the ta table of contents. If there's a section about the state regulator, yeah, it's probably a fully funded plan. Um, or you can call the number on the back of your card, member services number, and ask, or you can um, uh, you can ask your HR person. Um, and then another way to tell is, well, why does it matter? It matters because um, you get more, you can get more legal intervention from your state regulator if there's a problem, um, and they do more active enforcement. And if you're um, possibly uh, in a plan that's regulated in another state, the naic.org forward slash state underscore web underscore map it tells you what states, um, what agency regulates um, the insurance in that state. Self plans are minimally regulated by the Employment B Benefits Security Administration. It's a branch of the Department of Labor. As a general matter, they, you know, it's variable, but we have found as a general matter, they tend to not get that involved. Um, Office of Personnel Management, if you have a, if you work for the federal government, there's chances are that you are, um, in a plan that is administered by them, the Office of Personnel Management. And um, they had some changes that went through effective January 1st, 2017. They required that residential treatment be covered in all of their plans. And they also required that behavior health therapy for autism be covered in all of their plans. So that was a big step. I think it was a step towards um, uh, getting in, becoming conforming with federal mental health parity laws. They also provide speech and OT, but they do have limits on the number of sessions, and they um, tend to want to see a lot of improvement. Um, they also, for um, many of these treatments, they may have strict requirements for pre-authorization. So you want to know if your plan offers that, and you want to, um, uh, to look in the manual and see if um, you have to get pre-authorized to get any of these treatments. And if you do, you want to go in ahead of time and ask. Um, you have a choice of many plans, and it's worthwhile to read the manuals when choosing. Um, TRICARE, um, uh, if you have uh, tri benefits through TRICARE, they provide for um, uh, ABA through uh, the Autism Care Demonstration Project, and um, they may have different levels of copay uh, by whether or not you're retired or active. 
Um, and um, for mental health, they offer up to five months of coverage for residential treatment, which can be great, but um, they only offer it if you um, are in, a tri in the TRICARE network or a TRICARE approved facility. And so there's a fair amount of hoops that facilities have to jump through to get that status and we encourage you to investigate it um, before you enroll your child because it can be very difficult to get um, exceptions. Um, not so difficult to see an individual provider that's not part of that, but for facilities, yes, we found it's very difficult to get those exceptions. Um, so it's important to know that before you go in. Other government entities, if you work for a local um, government, not the state, uh, local county, your plan could be fully funded or it could be self-insured um, or you could have a choice with CalPERS. You actually have a choice. The um, HMOs are regulated, are state regulated and the PPOs are self-funded. However, they um, both in CalPERS, they cover um, residential treatment and they cover um, uh, ABA and that's effective I think 2014. Um, fully funded plans may offer more protections because they are subjected to federal mandates and the regulator will intervene. Self-insured government plans and religious org organizations may be exempt from ERISA, um, which is that federal law, and um, uh, they may opt to be exempt from federal mental health parity. So it's important for you to know that and to look in your plan manual and see if they are, if they make any reference to covering mental health care. Um, some plans offer ABA benefits and mental health benefits, some don't, so you wanna read your, mental, your um, manual on that. So um, if you are getting um, uh, MCLE credit for this, this is a number that you want to write down and you wanna fill it out on your, in the proper codes for each section. Okay folks, 4676. We have two more of these. Um, Medicaid. Medicaid is a combined national and state program. Medicaid provides um, mental health um, in most states. They do in California. However, it's carved out to the county um, for those with moderate to severe mental health conditions, except for autism. Um, autism is treated within the MCO, which is the Managed Care Organization. Um, if you have fee-for-service Medi-Cal, Medi then um, you may need to go through your regional center if you have an ASD condition. Um, if you um, have, uh, it it's, can be complicated to um, get services if you have uh, fee-for-service Medi-Cal and you're trying to get mental health services. You may be able to go through the county as well. But what is available varies by count, from county to county. Um, federal government got sued in three states for failing to provide uh, be behavior health treatment to, uh, to children with autism. Um, so this was in Florida, Louisiana, and Washington State. And they decided, no, we're not going through this again. We don't want any more responsibility. So they sent a memo to, each, to the, all of the states, and they told them, states, you have to provide behavior health therapy for your children with autism. It's required through EPSDT, that mandate I told you about um, a few minutes ago. And it's gonna be, you know, if you don't do it by 2019, there's gonna be more problems for you. So California got with it right away, which we have a lot to be proud of. Um, and they didn't in all states, but they are rolling it out state by state. Um, and um, as I said before, this is because of the, this law called Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis and Treatment. They have to screen that which is screens positive. They have to diagnose or assess that which is positive has to be treated. So that's the law. Um, but it's only for children, and we get calls all the time from very frustrated um, family members with young adults, and they want to get coverage for their um, adult child, like they want to get behavior therapy, and it's not available right now, and maybe we can get a mandate. Um, it's something on the horizon to strive for. Um, okay, in California, I said this before, effective July 1st, Medicaid was broadened um, to um, allow behavior health therapy to address those with other remediable conditions. 
Um, what are Medicaid waivers? Well, people with developmental disabilities um, uh, may qualify for a Medicaid waiver, and that means their the family income is waived. It means it doesn't count um, towards your ability to get Medicaid. And um, you can get these if your child qualifies or your loved one qualifies for regional center. You can get it through regional center. You can also um, access Medicaid. It's not really a waiver, but through SSI. Um, and there are also other paths to Medicaid. It can be used as secondary insurance. Um, if, you're, if you have like a loved one under age 26, they might stay on their parents' insurance till age 26. And um, it will cover co-pays if the provider ex works with Medicaid and the commercial plan that you have. So they have to be in network with both, and then it can work. Um, you're not supposed to pay any co-payments. Um, and it, it often works if your, child, if your loved one needs to be hospitalized, because a lot of hospitals do accept Medicaid. Um, and it also works, um, it can work with pharmacies if the medication is on formularies of both plans and the pharmacy takes, um, works with Medicaid, which most pharmacies do. Um, the other thing about Medicaid waivers is that um, it can offer access to in-home support services, which is something that you can get um, if you have um, usually a, a moderate to severe level of developmental disability. Um, and, but for regional centers, you don't just need an autism of di diagnosis, you need a moderate to severe level of developmental disability. Now, it does vary by region as well. Um, some are more permissive than, than others. Um, but you usually can't get the waiver until after age three. So this is a slide on medical necessity. And um, there are multiple definitions, but most private um, health plans will usually require that treatment ameliorate or manage symptoms or improve functioning of a given condition. Broader definitions include improving quality of life, lessening pain, and alleviating disability. EPSDT, that Medicaid law for children only, they have a higher standard. They must maintain a level of functioning and prevent deterioration. Um, school districts require an appropriate program. So that's, that's a totally different level. They're not, they don't have to totally address the um, condition. And so that's another reason why um, we, um, a lot of families work with insurance. Um, but health plans sometimes have more stringent definitions of medical necessity. Sometimes they demand a formal diagnostic assessment. Um, sometimes they want clearly articulated treatment plan with goals, and they often want a clear plan for discharge because they, they want to know how they're going to get you out of the treatment before they approve it. Um, so evaluation of progress through ongoing reviews by phone or in writing. This is a process, and it happens on the medical side as well, called utilization review, where they review what's going on. And for behavior therapy, it's typically every six months. Sometimes we see it every three months. For um, residential treatment and other forms of mental health therapy, it can be every few days. It can get really onerous. Um, and sometimes they require clinically meaningful progress, especially for those with severe challenges. This is something we've seen with kids with severe autism. They want to make sure that it's meaningful, uh, whatever that means. Um, and so we tell providers to keep the goals focused on treating the condition and stay away from academic areas, as they may try to um, argue that this is something that the IEP needs to address. Um, so with insurance, it's sometimes a fine balance between progress and need. They want to see some progress, but also continued need for care. Um, they can say that you've made too much progress and you no longer need treatment, or that you're mentally stable and no longer need treatment, or that they can try to say that um, you've made so much progress that um, you've made too much progress, or that you have not made enough progress and you're not benefiting from the therapy. So they can cut you off either way. Um, 
And for behavior therapy, we tell providers that making adequate progress towards discharge should mean that there's appropriate, that they're approaching age appropriate um, levels, milestones in most areas, or functional independence with their older. Um, for uh, residential treatment, um, they often want to see that the program is needed for safety, uh, medication adjustment or stabilization, and that's why it can be harder to make the argument over time. Now we often dispute this, and most, um, most uh, standardized measures will tell you that this is something you want for inpatient mental health. Um, and that's what we argue. We argue these standards are for inpatient, not residential. Um, but they often pu push back. Um, so sometimes they discharge after 30 days, regardless of what is going on. But we fight those. Requesting treatments. Um, for most plans, you can self-refer within the mental health network. Um, and so you want to call the number on the back of the card if there's a mental health number and find out who is in the network that can treat the condition. Um, for PPOs, it's going to save you a lot of money if you work in the network. So we encourage you to um, go to online um, for the list. Um, and we also encourage you um, to call and get names of people from the plan. Um, for speech and OT, if it's in an HMO or managed care setting, you may have to request from your primary care doctor because these treatments are considered medical. Um, for HMOs and EPOs, you must stay in the network unless the network is insufficient, and we're going to talk about that in a later slide. Um, for behavior health therapy and, re and residential, providers often must call to pre-certify, and they have to request written documentation and an authorization number. Um, so if you don't pre-certify, sometimes the plans have a financial penalty and others will deny outright, but if they have that financial penalty, sometimes it's a small amount compared to what you're paying out for behavior therapy or residential treatment. And so it's definitely worth it to find out if you're in a plan that has that, especially if you didn't or the provider didn't call and pre-certify. Um, so whenever you call the, the health plan, you always want to document it. You want to get a tracking number for the phone call. You want to find out who you're talking to. You want to write down the date, any details from the call. Um, and this has saved my clients a lot. Like I had a client where they told me we didn't have to go through pre-authorization. I knew that that didn't make sense, but I, I took the information down. I wrote down the name of the person. I got a tracking number, and um, we had to go through an appeal, but in the end, we won because we had that tracking number. Um, okay, this is another MCLE code. If you're um, getting um, continuing law credit, 2365, you're going to need to jot that down and fill it in um, in the, the section that asks for it. Um, so we talked a little bit about network insufficiency. If you're in a PPO or an, no, an HMO or an EPO, you, um, you're going to need, and you need to see someone that's not in the network, you're going to need to make the case that they don't have a sufficient network to treat the condition or that they don't have any specialists with the appropriate area of, of expertise. So um, most uh, mental health providers and, um, and autism specialists are in high demand. There are long wait lists to get in with behavior therapy. People have told me they have to wait six months. So the law in California is, it's the 15-15 rule. 15 days for mental health. Um, you, you, they're not supposed to let you make more, more than 15 days to get in with that provider, and they're supposed to, it's supposed to be within 15 miles of your home. So um, if you can't get in, you might want to ask for a written denial. They usually won't provide that, but it's helpful. And if no care is available or if there's long wait lists, call the plan and file a formal complaint. And then you can go to the state, either the DMHC or CDI, after 30 days, and they can try to help you work through that wait list. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Call often. Make a fuss. Be polite. But call a lot and let them know how much your child needs this. Um, if you know someone who can see your ch the patient sooner, call the plan and request a what's called a single case agreement with a provider um, that has availability. And um, GAP exception is sort of um, single case agreement light. 
If they can't agree to a rate, sometimes, especially if you're in a PPO, they will give you a gap exception and it allows you to use um, in-network uh, uh, co-pays and, and all that stuff. You might still have to pay the difference between usual and customary, but in network deductibles and co-pays, and you'll at least get some savings. Um, so single case agreement, when they don't have a um, provider or facility to treat a given condition in their network, you need to call the plan, ask who can treat this, um, and the plan is supposed to direct you to a list or give you a list of, of providers to call. And parent must make a good faith effort to call um, a reasonable number. Mark up the list. It's the proof that you did your due diligence. If nobody has availability at the right time, or if they don't call you back, or if they're not appropriate, call the plan back and request a single case agreement. If you some, know someone out of the network, ask for that person and get a tracking number to verify that you had that phone conversation. And then you want to um, go back to them and then the outside provider and the health plan need to talk. They need to agree to a rate. Um, and it can be a problem with Medi-Cal because they, often their rates aren't as high. The alternative is the gap exception. It allows you to use those in-network benefits. Um, and you can request a single case agreement for PPOs too. Sometimes they'll try to tell you, no, that's why you have these out-of-network benefits. No, you have the out-of-network benefits so that you can have the choice. Um, but if they don't offer you the choice, you have a right to use those benefits as in-network. Um, so what happens if you're denied? The, this is a list of what they're supposed to tell you um, in a denial letter if they're denying you services. They're supposed to clearly describe what is being denied. They're supposed to tell you why they're denying. And they can't just say it's not medically necessary. They have to tell you um, why it's not medical nece medically necess necessary. And they're supposed to give you a document to, that they used in making that decision. And they'll say that it's available upon request. So we encourage you to request those documents. Because if they don't provide them, they can get into trouble. They must instruct you on the next steps. How do you, where do you write the appeal? What do you need to submit? Where do you submit it? They must disclose the availability of um, the State Consumer Assistance Office. Well, this office isn't that helpful if you're in a self-funded plan. Um, if the plan fails to adhere to the requirements it Im and it impedes the process, you can um, request that you exhaust the appeal and go straight to external review or litigation. And this is all part of federal law, and it can be found in this code right here. Um, we're getting there. Uh, administrative denials, why is it not covered, is the reason written in the plan manual. If it's not written, so that means usually it's not covered. Um, if it's not written in the plan manual, it's a hidden exclusion. Hidden exclusions are illegal. Um, if they didn't pay appropriately, that's an administrative denial too. And you can dispute this and you can request that they re reprocess or you can call and find out why they paid the way they paid. Um, they must first take out the deductible and then um, if the facility or provider is out of network, they can pay a percentage coinsurance of what is usual and customary. And um, it's usually a much lower rate than you were hoping for. So these are common reasons for administrative denials. Uh, for residential, no 24-hour on-site service. Facilities not accredited, doesn't meet health care criteria. That's very vague. Wilderness or behavior therapy is not covered. Um, services are educational and not covered. Uh, Pre-authorization wasn't obtained. If you get that one, you want to look in your manual and see if there's a penalty for failing to pre-authorize. And you just say, please deduct that. Um, so many of these denials can be disputed. Uh, medical necessity denials, that's the other kind when they're saying that um, it can be done, it can be done at the, they're saying that services aren't medically necessary. It can be done at the start of therapy or it can be done later or they can cut back hours that they're providing and they must tell you why it's not medically necessary. Um, these are some of the common reasons that we see that we've talked about a little bit. Um, previously, appeals, some plans allow one level, others two levels. It's going to say in your plan manual. Um, 
If you're getting continuing care that they're cutting back or they're cutting back hours or they're trying to get you out of residential treatment that they've already approved, they're required to give you um, the option of expedited uh, appeal. Um, so that, and it, it says it goes through in three days. It takes a few weeks. Um, we recommend that you appeal in writing. For expedited appeals, they're going to try to get you to do it on the phone. We advise against that, and we do that because if you want to take your case further, um, you're going to need a paper trail. Um, we carefully review the reason for denial, and we tr try to address that when we write appeals for families. And um, if it's based on medical necessity, we describe the deficits and the challenges and the behaviors that um, require remediation. We address how the client meets the guidelines. Sometimes we will go through the guidelines like point by point. Um, if they don't provide you with guidelines or if their guidelines are really, really strict and the kids don't meet them, we use national guidelines. For, ch for children, we use Cal Locus for mental health um, residential treatment, Locus for adults, ASAM for substance abuse, and then the BACB, if you're disputing behavior health therapy, the BACB has developed some guidelines that can be very helpful, um, and we encourage you to go through them if they don't have their own guidelines or if their guidelines are just too strict. Um, so national standards tend to be less biased, um, and um, they're not out to make a profit. Current class action, there's, uh, currently um, there's a class action against United Healthcare. It's called WIT versus United Healthcare. And it's um, for using overly restrictive guidelines. And I went and attended a few days of that trial. The, tri the, the, the guidelines are literally on trial. It's kind of interesting. Um, so if you appeal, this is sort of a rough outline of what needs to be included in the appeal letter. Um, and including specific types of attachments that you want to include, especially with medical necessity. You want to include the medical records, the progress reports, so that they can see what the child has been doing. Um, if you have like an out of control teenager, you might want to include police reports, um, letters from therapists, um, and um, for continuing care denials where you're, um, they cut you off in the middle of therapy, you want to show what's been done. Um, and what has continued to happen to make t that justifies the need for treatment. Um, if there are in incident reports um, where the kids are acting out of control, you want to include those so that they see that there's a real need for this treatment. Um, if you have procedural violations, we encourage you to describe those and cite the law that's being violated. Um, and um, if they're not meeting the criteria, go through the criteria. Uh, regulatory intervention, that usually comes next. Um, if they're denied for payment or administrative if issues and it's a fully funded plan, the regulator will review them and intervene. If they're denied um, for medical necessity, you have the option of external review or litigation, and you do have both. You can go to external review first, but most litigators don't like it because you've already, you've got an external quote, independent person who's already saying you don't need the treatment. Um, external independent medical reviews. If you're denied in the appeal, the next option is an external review or litigation. External reviews are available for medical necessity denials, and they go out to an agency where an unaffiliated medical expert reviews the appeal and reviews the medical documents and makes a determination. And um, we have found in California that um, it's easier to win them for behavior health um, than it is for residential treatment. Uh, but we're fighting that and we're working on it, so stay tuned. These are some websites that um, should be very helpful uh, to, to families and to um, even providers. Um, I put up my own up there. We have some sample letters um, under our Medicaid tab. Um, that you can that may be helpful to you. Um, a parent support group for teens that are having mental health issues, Willows in the Wind. I've spoken to them. They're a great organization. Covered California um, may be able to provide you with information on what's covered and what's not for various plans and what the rules are. Um, state legislators, um, if you're having problems, especially with Medicaid, TRICARE, um, uh, they may be able to intervene and help you. Knowing a lot of these offices, they have um, 
constituent service, like a social worker that can help with constituent services. So, and they can also cut through red tape. Uh, rights under Lanterman Act, amazing document um, that explains everything that's covered under Regional Center. Um, special education information, rights law, um, dmhc.ca.gov, where you can file a complaint against your health plan. Um, these two Yahoo users groups are um, ones for uh, Kaiser families and ones for everyone else, where you can go to with a problem, um, uh, and they can advise you on where who to who to see for treatment, like maybe within Kaiser, who handles this or that. Um, and then info on disability, SSI, SSDI, qualifying for Medi-Cal. There's a great website in California. Well, it's not just in California, but this is the California link, california.db101.org. A lot of useful information. Um, and then you can subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, go to the homepage, mhautism.org. Scroll down, and there's an option to subscribe to the newsletter. So, we're almost to the end. Health insurance is a benefit that we pay for. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It takes time. Support is available. Do not be shamed into giving up. Um, only 10% of denials appeal, so the health plans literally are taking your money to the bank. So, don't take no for an answer. So, this is the final MCLE code that you need to enter on the sheet. Thanks so much for listening to um, this talk today. I know it's been it's been like an hour and um, unfortunately we were unable to take questions but I'm happy to entertain your questions. Feel free to send me um, an email Karen K-A-R-E-N at mhautism.org and I will make an effort to answer your questions. If you're a lawyer that's looking to expand into this area um, we often uh, need lawyers to hand off our cases to, and we are happy to um, work with you, and feel free to reach out and get in touch. We are a nonprofit, and um, we uh, do not get public support for giving these talks in the community. If this information was helpful, we very much encourage you to go to our um, website, and um, there is a tab for donate, and click on the donate button. We would very much appreciate your donations. Feel free to ask me questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity.